Good evening, everyone. I'm Mei Fang from CPF Board. Thank you for joining us uh, in today's webinar, Kickstart Your Financial Planning for Self-Employed Persons. So if you have joined us earlier, you have been listening to our CPF podcast and if you wish to listen to more, uh, have a catch the QR code just now. If not, uh, my colleague will also have uh, pasted the link in the chat box. So do check out our CPF podcast. Okay. So for today's uh, session, uh, as the title has implied, we're talking about um, you know, financial review, financial tips on um, how can you start a financial planning as a self-employed person. So for the first half, the, um, today, I'll be going through what are the key essentials of CPF for self-employed persons. Okay? And then for the second half, we will have a, a panel discussion where we'll have two other guest speakers with me, Desmond and David, which we will introduce later. And at 8pm, we will have a QA and a and we will end it at 8.30. Okay? So some admin details to go through uh, before we uh, start the session. So the chat function will be used to broadcast uh, messages from us. So like for example, um, the um, CBF podcast link. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, do feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A tab. Uh, do be mindful that uh, do not share any of your personal details uh, because um, my colleagues uh, and us will be able to see it. So if you have um, any um, questions that uh, you need to share personal details, do reach out to us instead. Okay? And of course, I think all of us are very familiar with Zoom. Uh, so if you face any audio or video uh, difficulties to leave and rejoin the session okay so let's start today um session proper okay so key essentials of cpf for self-employed persons okay so first of all i'd like to do a quick poll because i can't see you all uh, but i'd like to know like uh you know who are you all listening in uh watching in right now so um we will launch a poll okay um, and uh, let us know um which occupation do you take on are you a sole proprietor or freelancer or private uh, tuition teacher okay so uh let's see um you know just feel in to feel free to uh give your option and it's a multiple choice uh, option because we know that for some scps you could be um double helping or even triple helping so let us know which occupation you take on okay so we'll close the poll in three uh two and one okay so let's see the poll results okay so I can see the poll results here. Um, okay, I think um, quite a um, good number of you are from the um, financial industry, financial advisor yourself or property agent. Some of you are sole proprietors, uh, home-based business owners, and quite a number of you also are freelancers. Okay, so thanks for participating um, in this quick poll. Okay, so just to recap, okay, uh, who is a self-employed person? It could be that you just became maybe a self-employed person or maybe you are planning to be a self-employed person okay so uh, how do we define a self-employed person so, so a self-employed person scp for short uh, is someone who is under contract for service so you could be an individual with your own business you for yourself or you could be providing service for a company okay and you are a singapore citizen or permanent resident and you derive the net trade income from any trade profession or vocation so for self-employed person SCP, we are to uh, declare uh, your uh, net, net trade income NTI uh, to IRAS and IRAS will issue you a notice of assessment. Okay, so if you don't declare uh, your uh, NTI with IRAS, then you are required to re uh, also declare, uh, declare your NTI with CPF board. Okay, so why do we need to do so? Because from your declared NTI, then you will calculate the amount of contributions you need to make. Okay, so as SEPs, uh, you are obliged to make uh, massive contributions. Okay, and the amount of contribution is computed based on your age and NTI as, as, as assessed by uh, IRAS or declared to CPF board. Okay, so yeah, if um, you are not sure, you know, uh, because usually we declare NDI, uh, you know, at the end of the year. If you are not sure how much, you know, MediSafe uh, contribution you are supposed to contribute, you can actually um, try out our self-employed uh, MediSafe contrib contribution calculator by scanning the QR code. My colleague also have pasted the link in the chat. So scan and uh, have a rough estimation of how much MediSafe contributions are payable. Okay. And of course, once you declare your NTI, you will be able to check uh, your MediSafe payable at the self-employment dashboard by logging into our CPF website using your SingPass. Okay. So how much do we uh, contribute? Okay. So as mentioned, the amount um, to be contributed is calculated based on your NTI and your age. Okay. So I'll show an example here. 
Okay, and also to take note is that if let's say your NTI is below six thousand um, dollars, you will not be required to uh, make CPF uh, Medisave contributions. Okay, so for example, for someone who is between forty five to uh, below fifty years old, okay, and you earn a net trade income of above eighteen thousand, okay, so the percentage of um, the Medisave contributions you have to make will be ten percent of your uh, NTI. And it will be kept at a maximum seven thousand two hundred dollars. Okay, so as you can see from this table, the percentage that you are supposed to contribute really differs, uh, depends on your age and your NTI. Okay. So next important thing to note is uh, when and how do you make your CPF contributions? Okay. So do take note that the payment due date will be thirty days from the date of issuance of the notice of computation from IRAS. Or let's say you uh, declare your NTI to CPF board, there will be a notice of contribution. Okay, so it'll be 30 days from the date of both of these issuance of notices. Okay, and payment modes. Okay, um, first of all, we will definitely uh, recommend gyro installments. Um, you do not have to make the payment in lump sum. Okay, you can choose a uh, gyro payment, which is recommended as um, it allows automatic monthly deductions from your bank account. Okay. Uh, second um, payment mode would be uh, e-casher at CPF website or you can pay via NETS or cash at any Singpost branches. Okay. So we talk about you know, making uh, MediSafe contributions. Um, that's because it's very important um, to use those uh, MediSafe contributions to build uh, and use as a medical safety net. So in my subsequent slides, I will share more about how you can use your MediSafe. So MediSafe, um, I think most of all of us will know, uh, basically it's a savings account for our healthcare expenses. Um, I think we all know that in Singapore, um, healthcare expenses are very high and especially um, when you reach older age and in retirement years, healthcare expenses can be very, very expensive. So MediSafe comes in into for that. Okay? So the inputs will of course come from your contributions. Okay, and uh, government top-ups and any other uh, volunteer voluntary contributions that you can make. Okay, and of course, uh, within um, the C uh, MediSafe account, there's also the attractive interest rate between four to six percent to help you grow the savings. Okay, and for the savings, it's kept at the basic healthcare sum. Okay, now this basic healthcare sum uh, increases increases year by year up to uh, age sixty-five. So for those who are below uh, age 65, the basic healthcare sum for this year is at $66,000. Okay? And as mentioned, <coughs> sorry, um, MediSafe could be used for various users. So for example, you can use it for, um, of course, let's say for some of us, if you have chronic illnesses, for medication, uh, for health screening, etc. and medical bills, etc. Okay? So just now we had talked about MediSafe, then there's MediShield Life. Okay, some of y'all may be thinking MediShield Life sounds familiar. What exactly it is? So basically, MediShield Life is a healthcare insurance to help pay for your large health bills and selected costly outpatient treatments. Okay, and it's sufficient for subsidized treatments in public hospitals. So for example, if let's say you think about if let's say in the event that I'm hospitalized and I will just go for type B two or C ward. Um, medical life will be sufficient for that, okay? And also, medical life also cover non-subsidized treatments, um, but just that the payouts are of course smaller relative to the bill, okay? Now, medical life is automatically included for all Singaporeans and PRs, okay? So you don't have to worry that whether I'm in or not. As long as you are Singaporeans or PR, you are included, and it's regardless of age or any medical conditions. So for some of us, if let's say we buy private insurance, right? Um, you will know that if you buy from private, um, they will ask you, do you have any medical or uh, existing medical conditions? If there are the plan that you buy, you will be exempt, may be exempted from claiming uh, for that medical condition, or you may have to pay a very high premium. That's not the case for medical life. For medical life, you'll be covered regardless of age or medical conditions. And as the term medical life uh, implies, is coverage for life. Okay. Then uh, there's also cash life. Okay, so lots of schemes. So for medical life, we talk about healthcare insurance. Cash life comes in when, let's say, in the uh, unfortunate event that uh, someone is severely disabled. So it provides support for the severely disabled. 
how do we define severely disabled? So the severely disabled means that um, a doctor, doctor certified that you are not able to perform uh, at least three out of daily activities such as uh, feeding, transferring, or wearing your, even wearing your clothes. Okay. So for casual life, uh, it's universal for Singapore citizens and permanent residents born 90, 80 or later starting from age 30. Okay. So for example, for myself, I'm born in 1980s. I'm automatically included in casual life. Okay, so for someone who's testing in their 20s right now, they will be automatically under casual life once they turn 30. Okay, um, so you may ask, so how about those that are born in 1979 or earlier? So for those who are born in 1979 or earlier, you could be under the elder shoe, uh, which is an uh, older scheme uh, to casual life. So what are the benefits under casual life? Casual life will provide lifetime payouts in the event that you are severely disabled. Okay? And the potential payouts actually increase over time, starting at uh, $612 uh, 12 per month in 2021. Okay? And how do we pay the premiums? The pay uh, premiums payable from age 30 to 67 can be fully paid using Medisave. Okay? And of course, um, for those, let's say, lower income uh, groups, um, in order to make them uh, accessible and affordable, uh, the government do come in with certain uh, premium support package to make sure that they are also um, covered under casual life. Okay. So just now we talked about you know MediSafe um, using CPF uh, savings you know for your healthcare expenses. In the next few slides, I'm going to share with you. In addition to that, uh, how can CPF actually comes in to grow your other savings accounts and help in other key needs in your life? So very briefly, um, CPF actually um, uh, comes in to meet the three key needs in our uh, life, so that we can have, we can retire with a greater peace of mind. Okay, I share about healthcare financing, and so the second one I'll share will be home ownership. Okay, so I would say most, most of us will know that we can use our ordinary account to purchase a house. Um, with uh, housing pricing in Singapore, I think we will know um, we are not able to use um, full cash. Okay, so definitely um, we may need to rely on ordinary account to pay for our housing. Okay, so by using that to pay for our housing, right, um, in our old age, we have a fully pay out home. We do not have to worry about mortgage loans or rising interest rates. Okay. And lastly, of course, retirement income. Okay, CPF savings will give us a steady stream of uh, retirement income so that we do not have to worry that, you know, we may not have enough savings to meet our daily expenses, such as paying for our transport, food, etc. Okay. So just to give, uh, you know, a brief overview of the interest rates. Okay, keep talking about how attractive interest rates we have. Okay. So um, let's say if you are below age 55, okay, we have three savings accounts. We have OA, SA, and MA, earning 2.5 or 4% okay, per annum. And on the first 60% of your combined CPF balances, you can actually earn up to 5% per annum. Okay. And for those who are age 55 and above, you will have four accounts because at age 55, you will have the retirement account set up for you. Okay. And actually, the interest rate will be even higher. On the first 30% of your combined CPF balances, you can earn up to 6% per annum. And the next 30,000 of your combined CPF balances, you can earn up to 5% per annum. Okay. So we talk about you know, making uh, mandatory contributions, right? Actually, you can also choose to top up to grow your CPF savings. So in the next few slides, I will also share with you how you can top up to enjoy tax relief. So for under for SCPs, right, you can choose to make voluntary top-ups. Okay. So by making voluntary top-ups, the top-ups will go into your OA, SA, and MA. Okay. And SCPs can enjoy tax relief on both mandatory and voluntary contributions. Uh, the limit will be based on the annual uh, NTI, whichever is low, lower. So it's either the limit is either up to 37 of accessible income or up to the CPF annual limit of 37,740. Okay. Uh, do take note that there will be no tax relief for your mandatory or voluntary uh, CPF contributions if your assessed NTI for the year of assessment is zero or negative. Okay. So that's for voluntary top-ups. We also have another top-up scheme called the Retirement Sum Topping Up Scheme, RSTU for short. Okay. Now the purpose of the RSTU scheme is to really grow your retirement savings 
so that you can earn higher monthly payouts in your retirement years. Okay, so for RSTU, the top up will be to your SA for those below age 55 or RA if you are age 55 and above. Okay, so if you are below age 55, you can top up to your SA up to the prevailing full retirement sum, which is 192,000 this year. And those who are age 55, you can top up to your RA up to the prevailing enhanced retirement sum, which is 288,000. Okay. Um, so for um, those, uh, for cash top up, right, uh, for under this RSTU, you can enjoy tax relief for up to $8,000. Okay, so for, to find out more, do check out our CPF website. Okay. So just now I talked about, you know, you're making top up in thousands, you, then you may thinking, wow, I may not be able to fork out the lump sum. Actually, you do not have to, uh, you know, uh, top up in lump sum. You can actually consider making small and regular top ups, okay? So like as this, uh, you know, uh, illustration illustrates here, even a small top up of $50 per month, okay, could make uh, quite a significant increase to your uh, savings account in 20 years time because of the compound power of compounding interest okay so um if let's say you are probably thinking mm, i'm still young you know but if you start young actually you know by the time you retire that 50 dollars monthly top up could go to a quite a significant amount when you retire okay so yeah do consider making small and regular top ups and it's very easy you can actually uh, arrange for gyro Okay, um, gyro deduction monthly, or as and when if you you know you have extra cash, you can actually do a pay now to CPF uh, for uh, top ups. Okay. So for SCP, there's also um, other schemes that uh, are applicable to you. Uh, there's this contribute as you earn, uh, K for short. Okay. So under K scheme, it uh, basically helps uh, SCPs make smaller and more regular Medicare contributions as and when they receive payments. So for K, you may not find it familiar because for now, um, it's only applicable for uh, SCP who provides a contract for service to a government agency. So you're automatically enrolled uh, in K if you provide a contract of service to a government agency. So for example, you are a basketball coach, okay? You are a basketball coach and you coach uh, a secondary school basketball teams. So you will be automatically under K, okay? So for K, right, okay, um, when the government agency makes a payment to you, a portion of the payment will be directly transferred to the MediSafe account, okay, while the remainder will be paid in cash to the SCP. Okay, so how that's how K works. Okay. Now another scheme that is also applicable for SCP will be the Workfare Income Supplement. So basically this uh, Workfare Income Supplement scheme provides uh, eligible uh, SCPs with uh, additional CPF contributions and pay ca uh, and cash payments to help build up your uh, CPF savings. Okay, so there are certain um, conditions uh, to apply if uh, for eligibility. So if you want to find out whether you are eligible and uh, how much um, uh, the scheme, uh, a workfare scheme that you can receive, uh, you can scan this QR code or go to workfare.gov.sg uh, to find out whether you are eligible and how much you can receive. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of my sharing on the CPF obligations uh, for SCPs. So I've talked a lot already. So now let's go on to our discussion panel where we have our two guest speakers with us. Okay, so now let's welcome um, Desmond. Okay, so oh, sorry, let me do a quick introduction of both of them. Okay, so first of all, okay, we have uh, Desmond here. Okay, so Desmond is the uh, group director for uh, agency and self-employed group. Okay, and so this group is in charge of implementing various citizen uh, disbursements like uh, GSD voucher scheme, uh, welfare in Team, as well as various support packages reduced, uh, introduced in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the Self-Employed Persons Income Relief Scheme, SERS for short. Okay, uh, so that's Desmond. And then we will also have David later, who's our CPI volunteer, and he runs the blog Minimalist in the City. So some of you may have heard and read about the blog. Okay, uh, so uh, David is the founder of that blog. And he's also a financial coach with over 12 years of experience in international banking and financial services. So he is an SCP himself. So he also went through some financial challenges, which we will get him to share more later. 
Okay, so first let's uh, hear from uh, Desmond. So Desmond as the lead in uh, overseeing the self-employed scheme in CP Airport. Uh, can you share with us like how CP Airport comes into play in helping uh, SCPs meet these obligations? Yeah. My pleasure. A huge part of what we do in the agency and self-employed group is to help self-employed persons plan as of, and save for their health care and their retirement needs. So unlike employees, which I mean personally I am, um, employees have the luxury of entrusting their CPF matters entirely to their HR. Mm. For example, I don't need to worry about when my CPF contributions go into CPF, how do I make CPF contributions into my account? You know, unfortunately, for the self-employed, they have to do all this by themselves. So, they, you know, they have to know the processes, they have to understand the processes and contribute um, to the CPF on their own. So, to help self-employed to be able to make such contributions as well as take charge of their own retirement, a uh, large part of what we do the focus is to improve the service journey of self-employed as well as to you know, help them, empower them mm. to take charge of their own CPF contributions. So uh, we have introduced several initiatives over the years uh, in, 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 in these areas. First of all, for example, um, we have recently done away with the need for self-employed to register mm. their self-employed status when they turn become a self employed well as when they know they're no longer seven they do not have to deregister themselves uh, we will just take the information from iras when they make the declaration and then we will just send them the notice of computation we have shown earlier mm -hmm. directly without the need for them to come forward um, we also have made various tie-ups with the licensing authorities uh, we do not just of course just receive information about say when you have got a new license with uh, the LTA, we receive information, but we also use the licensing authorities as uh, channels for us to communicate uh, rules as well as processes, changes about the CPF schemes um, to the self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, we also, to make the, the contributions for the self-employed easier, we have also uh, been encouraging self-employed to sign on with our gyro plans with the CPF board. For those self-employed, uh, who are on our gyro plans, they do not really need to worry about uh, when to contribute or how much to contribute because as and when we receive the information from their declared income to the IRAs from their tax uh, declarations, those on gyro would ultimately have the uh, contributions amount contributed and not just that, we'll just do a monthly deduction from their bank account. So it makes it much easier for self-employed to take charge of their own retirement needs as well as health uh, medicine contributions. We understand there's a lot of information for self-employed to learn to know about, you know, and how do we make it easier for them to to uh, get hold of all this information? Some of the, uh, our uh, viewers today may actually notice that in the last one year we've introduced a uh, the Revenge CPF website. So on this website, we have also developed and launched a what we call a self-employed dashboard. On this dashboard. Um, Upon logging on this dashboard, the self-employed actually have all the information that pertains to them on their contributions as well as the self-employed records in one place. It's much easier for them to know as well as to, to basically find information about the self-employed matters. Mm. Yeah, so I think for, you know, if you are listening out there, you have been SCP for many years. Hopefully, you have seen the transition and changes we made over the years. I think like back then, there's a lot of hard copy paper and you have seen that there's a lot more digitalization. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you do find the improvements that we made, right? Do make your, you know, um, your submission uh, journey much easier uh, and more smoother. Yeah. So, I think uh, we have shared quite a fair bit about, you know, um, the CPS site. Um, of, of matters for SCP. So um, now we shall um, list, uh, hear from the SCP himself. Okay. So for David, um, can you share and introduce yourself uh, to the audience and share your own journey of uh, your of as, as a SCP? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure. Okay. My name is David. Uh, I'm the author of Minimalist in the City. Uh, which is talking about um, personal finance and then talking about minimalism. So. Um, I used to be a SCP in the past, um, 
many, many years back. And then I was an employee for a period of time and now I'm an SCP again. So I have various experience uh, being an SCP and also as a business owner. So um, I venture into this journey of like SCPs, self-employed and business, right? It's because um, it was during a time when I was pretty young and I was uh, as a regular in the Air Force. And then my, my father started to um, get retrenched at the age of 50. And that's where the whole financial world uh, came crumbling down on me. Because I'm the eldest in the family, I got to manage the finance. So when he lost his job at the age of 50, um, I got to make a stand with my family, with my brother, my, my brother, and then my, my mother to kind of like make some big financial decision as to whether to continue to pay the mortgage for our current place. So that was uh, the first challenge. And then after we came to a discussion and I came to a con conclusion that we should sell this place and then we move on to a new place that's fully paid for with a uh, contribution from myself and my brother who have quite limited uh, CPF during then. So uh, we kind of like contributed to it and then but the property is basically fully paid for. But my father, he himself is a compulsive gambler during then. So we have some other problems like to settle kind of his uh, financial obligations. Uh, we took out some personal loans in that sense and then to kind of like uh, pay off his uh, financial obligation and then to make us completely debt free in like two, three years time. So that's where I, I realized that hey, my father has been working like for 20, 30 years, but yet he still don't have like money at the end of the day. So I was like, I went into this rabbit hole of personal finance. I, um, I've been reading a lot about financial blogs, reading a lot about uh, financial books on how you can and then one of the book that actually strike, um, that was a game changer for me was uh, for the Rich Dad Poor Dad book. They talk about the ESBI quadrant. E, employed. Uh, S, self-employed. B, business. And then I, investor. So as a regular in Air Force, I was obviously an E. So I eventually quitted the Air Force. And then I went into a bit of um, self-employed and a bit of business. So I was side hustling um, throughout my um, from 25 years to 30 years old, during the time period, I was like side hustling a lot. So, uh, but, uh, but because self-employed is, you are still depending on yourself to earn the income. So uh, I find a bit uh, risky, as in a sense, if I fall sick one day, then who will take care of me? So I started to venture out into a franchise business when I was like 20, 27. So, um, but at the same time, I also venture into the I quadrant, talking about uh, being an investor. So I was trying out both. But then the franchise business, it was going well for the first three years, but uh, because there's some, a lot of differences when the company grows and then we have more, we are controlling more franchise shop. And then there's a lot of differences between all the different partners. So I eventually exited and took up a very, um, a kind of like a six figure debt. Uh, at almost the age of 30. So it was like my lowest point of my life. And then I realized that um, that's not the end. I still have to repay my debt. My girlfriend was still with me at that point of time. So we were planning to get married, that kind of thing. There's still a lot of things going on. So I need to kind of like pick myself up and then settle, settle all the loans, everything, and then kind of like move on with my life. And then uh, at the same time, just before my marriage, I sent an email to my wife uh, detailing about my, my journey of going to financial independence by the age of 40, which is like a 10 years time period. So it's like something that I want to kind of like want to reach in 10 years time. So um, yeah, so ironically, recently when I took out an email, it was like, wow, okay. Uh, wow, well, everything that I detailed down, I like, kind of like want to achieve what kind of house I want, what, what, how many kids I want actually. That plan was uh, very uh, scarily similar. So, I mean, so some will you say yeah. that you, have you reached? <laughs> so it's not just a financial plan, it's literally a life plan. Yeah, it's literally so a life plan. So have you, so just now you say that you detail out when you want to achieve your financial independence, yeah, right? right? Have you achieved it already? Yeah, I achieved it at the age of 40. So wow, okay, <laughs> okay. That's great, that's great. Well, okay, um, thanks uh, uh, David for sharing candidly about your life journey. I think 
Yeah, everybody's uh, have very different life circumstances. Mm. I, I think like what you mentioned about your father and I think for the older generation, um, it's more of like, I think financial literacy that they are lacking. Mm. Both, um, my father, he was bankrupt. Mm. He was bankrupt when I was in my uh, studying year. So we also went through a little bit of um, financial difficulties. Mm. I remember I have to go to the school and apply for some um, subsidies mm. and all that. So yeah, so now that you mentioned, I think looking back, it's really about, you know, for their generation, it's about financial literacy yeah. and I think the lack of Google, you know, yeah, um, blogs, which actually now, um, we actually we do have a lot of uh, this fin- uh, Google and blogs that can help us. La. So hopefully, you know, our generation, mm-hmm. even for myself, I, I, I have to admit, I have to do a lot more reading up mm-hmm. to learn more about financial literacy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah even though I'm in CPF board. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so maybe let's uh, go back to uh, Desmond. Okay, so um, just now, I think um, we briefly also talked about the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, just want uh, Desmond to share whether, like, you know, in... Um, do we observe like uh, more citizens uh, set, stepping forward to approach a CPF board uh, for assistance because of the pandemic, or even now as we see uh, uh, inc- uh, increasing uh, cost of living due to the inflation? Yep. Mm. Again, um, compared to employee like myself, <laughs> there are uh, different challenges for the self-employed. The for self-employed persons tend to you know. Like they mentioned, a lot of volatility in the income. Mm. There are good times and there are bad times. And a lot of times, uh, these factors are externally driven. Mm. A lot of times, they're not within the control of yep. the self-employed themselves. So, earlier I mentioned, you know, um, some people have regular contributions from the CPF um, through gyro. or others, they do uh, make one-time payment of their CPF contributions. And for these people, they really have to have the discipline, mm. you know, to set aside monies for their Medisafe uh, contributions. We know that um, sometimes for situations beyond their controls, uh, self-employed uh, may have problems um, uh, meeting their Medisafe uh, liabilities as well as obligations. Which is that's the reason really why, um, like you mentioned earlier, we have uh, piloted a scheme called Contribute As You Earn. Uh, in 2020, under the scheme, we found that earlier mentioned, uh, one way to help the self-employed to set aside uh, savings as well to avoid the uh, fluctuating income is that to have a part of their um, service payments, you know, at that point where they earn the, the income, have it um, used to contribute see it directly and the rest um, uh, paid to them as um, to their income. So for Many self-employed on this scheme currently who are working with the public sector, a lot of them do manage to avoid some of the challenges uh, like what you mentioned during COVID-19 because you know, it, was, it was a very systematic way um, for them to meet their obligations to their MediSafe. Of course, there are others um, uh, who do face challenges during the extremely difficult uh, COVID-19 period. Uh, take for example, you would hear of uh, stories of tour guides, for example, for the period where there were no tourists, uh, mm. where do they, um, how do they meet their obligation to their medicine? Of course, during that period, um, the government did out several uh, initiatives to help this um, self-employed. Um, many of you would be aware of the uh, SERS or Self-Employed Income Relief Scheme. Uh, for for them, where we actually we there was a uh, income supplements for the self-employed. Some of them actually use uh, some of these uh, government grants to help them pay off their Medisafe uh, obligations. Even then, uh, you are right. We have uh, some self-employed who, despite all this, have challenges meeting obligations. And uh, for this self-employed, uh, we do work with them individual individually on a case-by-case basis to work out a uh, plan for them to meet their MediSafe uh, contributions. For example, we might be uh, helping them spread out their payments over a longer period of time. So each time they make less contribute, uh, able to, to fork out. But what we want to really encourage them to do is to um, build up a habit of um, making regular contributions such that they will be less susceptible to the uh, fluctuations in their income. 
um, of course, for on the to meet their longer term uh, retirement and healthcare needs, what the government has done um, again, like what Mei Fang has mentioned, we are also uh, been uh, giving um, self-employed, I mean the lower income ones on the the WIS uh, welfare income supplement um, for the work year twenty twenty three, which is the upcoming year. What we have done is that we have uh, increased the limit. Um, for those who are receiving the WIS as well as the amount that we are paying out under WIS. So together, hopefully, this whole package, uh, we are able to help self-employed set aside more savings for their retirement. Mm. So I guess we can all agree that um, cash flow management is usually one of the very common uh, challenges uh, faced uh, by SCPs. Lah. So, and, um, and in addition to that, um, not just that, you may also have to uh, think about long-term goals. So for example, like David has shared, he planned out his entire lifetime goal, like, you know, setting up a family, buying a house, etc. So uh, all this will mean that, like, including myself, actually, we do need to um, set up some plan, set up some uh, financial goals and start some financial planning. So for now, uh, I'd like to do a quick poll here to um, like to ask, like, if, um, you know, just curious, have you started financial planning? Okay. So let's do a quick poll. There are four options for you, okay? So um, the first two, the first one is uh, yes, um, I'm on track to achieving some of the goals. Uh, yes, have started some planning but have not achieved my goals yet. Um, last two is no, um, is no, but I'm interested. You are interested, you would like to know, but, but you don't know how to start, okay? And lastly, you said, you probably will be like, mm, no, I don't intend to plan and just let nature take its course. Okay, so let us know. Like, um, where are you right now? Have you started, not started, and where are you? Yeah, okay. So we will close the poll in three, two, and one. Okay. So let's get the results. Okay. Well, okay. So 50% of y'all said that yes, you have started some planning, but you have not achieved uh, your goals. And the remaining half said that yes, um, and you are on track. And the other half said that, no, you're not interested. And I'm very happy to see that none of your chose, no, you don't intend to plan, okay? That's very good because if, you ha if I have seen like, no, you don't intend to plan, then um, I, will, I will actually ask you that, no, you actually do need to plan, okay? But yeah, thanks for sharing. I think it's uh, quite heartening to see that actually, you know, in combined, 75% of your said that, yes, you have started some planning, uh, but you have not, but the rest of your if um yeah you have not started planning hopefully after this session um we you maybe have to pick up some useful tips on how you can start okay so um yeah thanks for joining us in that poll okay so now um back to um david okay so david just now you so briefly mentioned about our financial independence um i think it's quite a uh, very hot word now actually i think the full term is called fire right uh, financial independence and retire early so i think i've been catching the news and it's been very a uh, hot word now um, but i think the definition may differ people to people mm -hmm. so for david um, what does financial independence um, define for you oh so for me myself um financial independence means uh i i, I base it on maslow hierarchy of needs so, so basically for me, during when I pen now, that plan is like ten over ten years ago. So financial independence to me during then was was that. So uh, basically, I just want to settle all the basic needs. Basically, a uh, roof over your head, food on your table, childcare needs, uh, medical needs, insurance, basic insurance needs, and then yeah, basically the basic stuff mm -hmm. that I need to cover. Mm -hmm. So once you get all these things covered, right, then to me is uh, I don't really have to think much about my daily. Mm. Necessity, so that I can focus on something that I can do more. Mm. Yeah, correct. So, like financial independence, retire early. Do you believe in retiring early? And maybe, like, what is the age that you are looking at retiring? Actually, I I don't know about. I mean, years back, I was like looking at all this. I was like, I mean, I've been researching a lot on all this. So, um, uh, I thought I I always advocate like financial independence. But I don't really advocate retirement early. <laughs> yeah, so as you see, I, I kind of like reach F5 at the age of 40, mm. but that I doesn't really look like anyone who is who mm. retired. I'm still engaged in all these activities. I'm still mm. doing all these passion projects. But uh, together with my wife, she's also doing something. She recently did a mid-career switch. She also do something very, mm. uh, she's very passionate about. So 
um, to me, financially independent allow us to do that. So that is good enough. But retire early and probably if not doing anything, probably uh, it's not it's not my definition of uh, not, financial independence. Yeah. Okay, okay, you can. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, financial independence for David. So actually, I wanted to also uh, touch a bit about the minimalist. So just now we mentioned that uh, he has a blog called Minimalist in the City. So yeah, so maybe David can share with us like um, about your minimalist uh, lifestyle and how actually does it affect your financial planning as well? Uh, yeah, I chanced upon minimalism like probably six years back and then 2016 where I started the blog with my wife. Um, Actually, she was the one who introduced me to minimalism. I mean, I mean this, this book called Marie Kondo, <laughs> yes. uh, The Magic of Tidying Up, that kind of thing. So I went into the rabbit hole of minimalism and then I started, whoa, actually there's a lot of meaning in minimalism. Mm. As in, we don't, we don't kind of like value our life based on what we have. We value our life based on what we value. I mean, like the core values that we have, the principles. So that kind of like changed my mindset towards focusing more on our principle, our values, rather than the social status stuff mm -hmm. that everyone probably is chasing all this while. Yeah. So it kind of like uh, take away all this frivolous part and then focus on all the important part. It's like for me, I focus more on family, focus more on my health, more on my kids, more on reading. Yeah. So I don't really have to focus on um, probably other bigger ticket items, that kind of thing. So it mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, kind of like make the financial independence 10 year plan even even easier in a sense because you don't really need so many things to, to really reach that point. Yeah. So in a sense, minimalism is also somehow tied back to the Maslow need of hierarchy, right? Because uh, yeah. it's about way, yeah. getting and buying what you need yes, and correct. not what you want, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, <clears throat> sorry, it's also like a reminder to myself because I think all of us, you know, with materialism around us and marketing around us, we do tend to buy a lot of things. So I also read out about, yeah, the Marie Kondo, the spark mm, joy. Yeah, um, I think it's great that we, uh, people are more aware of it. Lah. Mm. So, so you agree that, you know, because of the minimalist lifestyle that you take on, it helps to fasten your financial goals? Yeah, definitely. You you fasten. I mean, you will kind of like uh, bring the water basically, mm. and then you are you find it even more enjoyable because you are you kind of everyone is like searching for the big thing, mm. the big item that will make them happy. Yeah. But mm. actually, actually, most of the important stuff, if you search deeply inside, right, is already with you. Yeah. Yeah. So. So the thing is, because you have children, right? Yeah. Children. So maybe for those who with families, right, you must be wondering. If I have children, how can I be minimalist? Because for children, we will buy toys and all that. So right. how do you, actually, how do you educate your children on minimalist and how to tell them that, oh, we just get what we, we need and not what yeah, we Yeah, actually, want. for children, I think it's quite tough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I still make it a point to kind of like reuse, I mean, the three R reuse and then, yeah, reuse toys or I mean, reuse mm -hmm. clothes or this thing and pass it down, you know, uh, more on the three R fight side. I need to make it more sustainable. And then at the same time, I advocate not on toys. I mean, uh, the grandparents and parents will definitely buy toys for them. Mm. But I kind of like, if they don't really like the toy, I'll just resell it on carousel or something like that. So that it can be reused. And mm. then, yeah, because your kid don't really play their toys all the time. Yeah. Mm. So I advocate more on the free activities, like outdoors, nature walks, going to the library, mm. all this stuff. So they kind of like enjoy it. My younger boy was like five years old, probably didn't really, really uh, realized, right? I mean, <laughs> half his life is in COVID, so he didn't really uh, get the gaps of it. But my young, uh, my older girl is eight. Now she's like, you don't really buy a lot of stuff. So she kind of like enjoy more nature walks with me, mm -hmm. spend more time with me, that kind of thing. So time is probably more important for her. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, okay, so maybe we'll start wrapping up our discussion panel. So maybe as the last question for both uh, Desmond and David, okay. So for David, as a SCP who went through all these financial uh, challenges, right, is there any must-do that uh, you feel SCP should do, like when it comes to financial planning? Financial planning. Uh, mm. Basically, to me, uh, just now a lot of people post no plans, right, but I think it's better to have a plan because at the end of the day, right, Having a plan is better than have no plan. At the end of the day, once you have a plan, you can at least gauge yourself or benchmark yourself towards a, a direction that you want to go to rather than you are going in, into the business aimlessly mm. or something like that. Yeah. 
Mm. So I think having a plan is very important. So like example, at certain age, you know, maybe you aim to clear like how, yeah, how much debt, yeah. Mm, yeah, that kind of thing. And Maybe also definitely. like how much savings you should have yeah, like yeah, a certain I age. Think, I think that is important. Yeah. Okay, can. Mm. So from Desmond, so like let's say as a SCP when it comes to CPL contribution, what do you think they, they must do? Like as a, um, you know, from your position, like do you think there's something must do that SCP must do? I think um, for the SCPs, basically now the man mandatory contributions are only for their um, healthcare needs, only mm. to the MediSafe account. Mm. Um, like what David mentioned, is you know it's important to have a plan. How much you want to set aside for retirement, mm. and you know that retirement is not just about healthcare. Mm. You you earlier mentioned about uh, having set aside uh, monies for their day to day expenses. Mm. So for the self employed who are able to uh, set aside more savings, I would really encourage them to make their voluntary contribution to the CPF account. Mm. Um, for many of us, actually, um, CPF, by virtue of its uh, interest rate, is a very attractive interest rate. You mentioned just mm. now, it should form a very good balance or the foundation mm. for their uh, retirement savings. You know, that's something they can draw upon when they reach um, retirement age. You know, they have a steady stream of income uh, that can come up via the CPF life. Mm. And uh, that's really something that uh, I would encourage every uh, self-employed person to start thinking about because uh, really uh, it is, I would say, currently not many instruments out there would have the uh, attractiveness in terms of interest mm. rates and returns compared to the, to the CPF. So um, it might be a, a bit of selling koyo, but <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I think it's really something I, I personally believe in. Yeah, so actually I was just, uh, I think, reading out the news this, mo this morning. They were saying that the various banks have increased the fixed deposit oh, rate. Yes. Just this morning. So, yeah, I was reading the news and then I think the highest was, is it 2.6? Yeah. 6. So I was thinking, mm, actually, CPF interest rate is still higher because yes. as I mentioned just now, if yes. you are above 55, right, it's actually up to 6%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, nothing can beat CPF interest rate. Okay, so yeah, so like uh, Desmond mentioned, if you have, uh, you know, the extra cash, uh, do consider uh, topping up because eventually it really will lead to uh, higher retirement savings and lead to higher payouts in the future. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so thanks um, Desmond and uh, David for your share. So now we will go into our Q&A, which I believe we see quite a number of questions, okay? Uh, we'll try to answer as much, uh, as many as we can, and our apologies if we are not able to answer all tonight, okay? Uh, if you have any uh, questions that we are not able to cover tonight, uh, do write in to us at our CPF web website, which uh, my colleague will paste the link at the chat box, okay? So now let's go on to our first question. Okay, so this question is for Desmond. Okay, um, so this person asks, um, do I still have to contribute to Medisafe as a self-employed person, even though my Medisafe balance has reached the basic healthcare sum? Okay, uh, if let's say if it has reached, uh, where would these contributions go? Well, um, the simple answer is yes. If you are even uh, self-employed. Uh, as long as you have declared the net trade income to the IRAs, you will still need to make contributions to your CPF. Um, if you have really reached your um, basic sum, the um, uh, savings will overflow to the other retirement accounts, namely the special or the ordinary account, depending what's your balance. Um, why do we uh, feel that this is an important thing? Because like earlier I mentioned, uh, what we are hope to do is really to help self-employed persons um, achieve um, really what David mentioned, you know, um, retirement adequacy. Mm -hmm. We're not able to the right. stand of um, <laughs> financially independent. It's just retirement adequacy. And having monies in the ordinary as well as a special and medicine account definitely is, the I would say, that currently the most expedient way for to, uh, to achieve your retirement goals. You know, I, I talked about the uh, interest rates that you mm -hmm. earn on the OA, SA, and, and MA. And uh, really, all these contributions will really go to help an uh, individual meet their health care as well as retirement needs. Mm. Okay, yeah. So if, let's say, you have been paying and you really reach your uh, basic health care sum, yeah, the excess, like what Desmond sh uh, shared, will be flowed to your either SA if you are age uh, 55 and uh, below or RA yeah. if you are age 55 and above. Okay. So next question is uh, also for Desmond. Okay, so this person asks, 
why is the requirement for license renewal tied to fulfilling my Medisafe obligations? Well, uh, what uh, I'll just put it is, uh, it's just our gentle reminder <laughs> to our self-employed persons there to um, continue to contribute to your Medisafe account because ultimately you will need this Medisafe uh, savings um, during retirement to meet your health care needs. Um, I believe the, this question stems from the earlier question, you know, um, probably what if I face challenges in uh, meeting my uh, medisafe obligations, uh, what can we do? Um, we, we, I can, if you really have challenges in meeting your um, uh, medisafe obligation, we, we thought we are helping them earlier through the gyro deductions, through K. Of course, ultimately, if you really still have a challenges in meeting your obligations, um, do talk to us. Um, we will work with you to find a way to help you meet your oblig uh, MediSafe obligations. For example, uh, spreading out your payments in, over, over a period of time into smaller amount. Um, ultimately, we are with you, you know, really in, in, in achieving your retirement goals. Mm. Uh, I think because, you know, CPF board, people think that government, thing who, right, like maybe a bit cold-hearted, but that's not true. Lah. Uh, I think what Desmond is uh, also mm. saying that if you have difficulties, do reach out to us early. Yeah, yeah we will try to help. We do, um, you know, assess our appeals individually and assess case by case. Lah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next question is for David. Okay. So this person asks, as an SCP, there may be times where we don't have any or much income. How do you balance savings to tide over periods of low income versus saving for retirement? Mm, okay, yeah. Um, so you need to, again, you still need to have a plan <laughs> <laughs> to kind of like balance the savings. And then, uh, so when, when there's a period of high income, you need to put away more. Like in a sense, like, um, but because most people, they are not probably disciplined enough. So probably the, the contribution to CPF will kind of like make sense. In a sense, like if uh, during then when I was doing my business, if I didn't kind of like contribute to certain uh, CPF schemes or whatever during then, uh, probably when I, I told I was in six-figure debt during that time, if I, I thought that I lost everything. But actually, in fact, my CPF is still there. Mm. So that kind of like, um, kind of like helps me to kind of like go out with my plan of buying a new flat with my wife during that time. So, uh, so in terms of this, it's like planning low income uh, versus, okay, so when you are having high income, probably you need to save a bit more, like kind of like contributing mm. to CPF or something like that mm. if you are going to get a house or you are planning for retirement. So I think uh, it depends on your needs. So probably if the short-term goal is uh, housing, so probably you could put more into housing and then, but you still need a bit on retirement. So that's why CPS scheme works in, I mean, to me, it's like, these are all the, all the important needs. Mm. OA uh, for your housing and then SA for your retirement, Medisa for your medical needs. Mm. I mean, if I, during the time when I went bankrupt, if all this is being wiped out, right, then probably I don't even have a medical mm -hmm. yes. scheme to, to uh, leverage on. Yeah, mm. that kind of thing. So actually, we forgot to ask you a very important <laughs> question. You top up CPF, right? Yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before I, uh, because I've been like in business after that, I went bankrupt, right? Kind of like bankrupt. I mean, in debt. Uh, then uh, I kind of like found uh, become an employee again for the last mm -hmm. ten years in the financial uh, mm -hmm. in banking industry. So during then, I was doing a lot of like uh, top ups. I was doing a lot of uh, transfer OA SA transfer. Mm -hmm. So recently, before I venture into becoming a financial coach, I kind of like um, I top up my CPF until the point of FRS. Mm. So I'm now FRS already. So at the same time, uh, just now uh, Desmond talked about the, the foundation, right? So I think after all this year on high side, I think that CPF still form a very important foundation for me mm. personally. Even though I kind of like, most of my portfolio is uh, property and investment. So, but, but that is uh, varying risk. So CPF is like the bottom, is the foundation of your whole uh, financial house. Mm. Then the next layer probably will be your SSB, your fixed D, then will form the next layer, which form your part of your emergency cash. Mm. Then after that, the next layer will be property or then equities, mm. and then eventually some people probably going to do Bitcoin or whatever. <laughs> so that will be a last. Yeah. So it depends on your risk. It's about risk profiling and mm. asset allocation. Right. So ultimately, I think CPF is a very important 
um, source of uh, this solid foundation, which I cannot find anywhere else. Like, uh, I mean, there's a limit how much you can use CPF. Yeah. You can top up to FIS, yeah. but that's, that's about it. But then there's no other way to kind of like leverage it anymore. And you've got to go on other, other asset class, like, basically, yeah, mm -hmm. which you have to take on more risk. Yeah. It's a safety net. Yeah, like what you say, net. even like when my father went bankrupt also because he can't touch his CPS. So yeah. thank goodness he still has some savings for yeah, his correct, retirement correct. now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, for, for that note, right, I think I have one thing is like, because my, my parents wasn't very savvy with money, right? Mm. So at the end of the day, right, they, they didn't save up anything. At the age of 50, they don't have retirement funds. Anything. But now, right, they, I mean, I kind of like build, build, build them an equity portfolio, mm. give them dividend, that kind of thing. Then they have, they already kind of like, uh, they are on FIS, yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, CPF life, like basically, mm, CPF life. Yes. And they are still working. So I find that, eh, actually, for people who are not disciplined and they're not savvy, at the end of the day, CPF kind of like build them up. In a way, like, now on hindsight, I was thinking, yeah, they build them up, yeah. yeah. In yeah. a way, yeah. yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, that's a CPF, like, it's a safety net for all of yeah, us. Yeah, it's a safety okay. net, yeah. And let's uh, move on to our next question. Okay, uh, so this question is for uh, Desmond. Uh, as, an, as, an, as an SCP, can I make uh, voluntary top-ups to the ordinary and special accounts? Uh, can you share more about the top-up schemes into the various accounts? Okay, that's for self-employed, of course. Currently, um, you can make top ups, but the top ups goes into the uh, three accounts, to the, uh, all three accounts. So, in other words, it's um, very similar to how we make contributions uh, as a uh, employee. It goes to your OA, SA, as well as the MA. Uh, of course, um, if you are um, already have your uh, BHS, the BC healthcare sum, the the monies will just go to the uh, two accounts, lah. Then and then of then and then of course within the accounts you can opt to transfer more monies from your OA to your SA to earn a higher interest rate. So that's really uh, up to that individual. Um, for some of us, we also make direct contributions, uh, top ups into our RA or SA or to our MA. So all these um, uh, schemes they do have uh, tax relief. So that's something uh, we you all can look into. Um, but uh, to really come back to this is uh, when we do contributions, I would. My own personal recommendations is that you do make a contribution into your uh, your RA first, and because I think retirement is really a, a useful one. Mm -hmm. uh, then followed by your MA, and then you really want you can go into your three accounts, mm -hmm. which is the RSTU, the retirement yeah, sum yeah. tax scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just now actually I also briefly shared about you know if you make a top up under the RSTU, you mm -hmm. get eight thousand yeah. dollars cash re relief, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, if you also make a top up for your loved ones, yes. you get additional 8,000 tax mm. relief. So, in total, if let's say you make tax relief, uh, sorry, you make top up for yourself and your loved ones, in total, you can get up to $16,000 tax relief. Okay. So, next question is also for Desmond. Okay. Uh, I have contributed up to the maximum mandatory contributions for the year. Do I mm. still have to make uh, contribute as you earn contributions? Uh. Yes, you still have to make uh, your, your contributions uh, from, from a K. But of course, at the end of the, of the year, we have assessed that you have maximum, then we will maybe invite you to come forward to um, whether you want to, to have a refund for the amount that you make contributions. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay, so for David, this question, okay. Uh, this person asks, what do you do to achieve uh, financial independence by age 40? Do you invest in the stock market? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, basically, um, initially, most of my portfolio is all paper assets, basically. So, equities, um, stock market, ETF, funds, all this. Uh. So, uh, but that kind of like take out a, a, a bit of work. I mean, initially, I started with like stock. So, uh, now I'm kind of like transiting more to, towards ETF and funds, which is more diversified, and then the risk is more diversified. But I think, um, I think any instrument, they have their pros and cons. Uh, to kind of like reach financial independence, you kind of like, you definitely need to tap on one of these asset class, basically. But uh, you might not be, I mean, for me, I try out like business, I try out self employed then I try out investing. But then it seems like investing kind of like work for me. So I find investing is better for me. So I will, even, even within the investing space, right, there's so many, different instruments. 
So you must find the one that, that suits you best. Mm. And then, uh, so that you can, uh, I mean, because not everyone does it well, as in, uh, mm. like example, like my wife, they, she doesn't really bother about this, but because I have a certain interest in it, and then that's why I managed to kind of like manage our family portfolio. So, uh, so far, I mean, the returns uh, doesn't have to be like, ex uh, I mean, like extraordinarily high, but if it's, like, like the case for like CPF, right? If you talk about 4% compounding over like the 20, 30 years, right? I think it's a very compounding machine. Mm. So equities, uh, stock market is something like that. If mm. you can find something that can mm. compound you 5, 6%, not extraordinary returns, but it will slowly mm. go out. And then you, if you're disciplined saving all this thing, I mean, with my minimalism lifestyle, you save out a lot, you stash away more money, mm. invest in stock market, some of it in CPF, which we, we still do. I mean, we, my wife is still currently working, so she still top out her CPF, that kind of thing. Mm. So uh, it's basically, a, I think, uh, asset allocation, it depends on your risk profile, all this stuff. Mm. So I think, yeah, that, I mean, to, to learn investing, it will be very important, other than CPF. Mm. <laughs> because I think, the, I mean, after that, the higher the returns, right, it means the higher the risk, right? Yeah, in a so, way. Yeah, so, yeah, so I guess, if let's say you do not have a very huge risk appetite, then uh, maybe start small or yeah, or maybe don't. Like for myself, I, I'm afraid of investment. Yeah. So I don't do <laughs> investment in stock actually. Okay, yeah, right. okay. Uh, okay. next question is uh, also for uh, Desmond. So, uh, so this person, right, uh, he has more than one source of uh, trade income. Mm. Okay, so does uh, he or she have to contribute to Medisave for all of them? And then, uh, in that case, how do they calculate the net trade income? At the end of uh, every year, I believe uh, every self-employed would have to declare to IRAS uh, what is their net income, uh, as well as the expenses on all their income. And basically, the, the net trade income, or NTI in short, is what you earn, less what you have uh, expended for your various trades, various streams of income. So what we do is that we aggregate the sources of all this income, you know, what you really earn. If they we got five businesses, what you've earned in the five mm -hmm. businesses, or rather not what we do that, but just what IRAS does is that, you know, they take what you earn for the five businesses, less what you have expense for your five business to get your NTI. Mm -hmm. So, and from there, then we'll, uh, we will um, uh, calculate how much MediSafe uh, you need to contribute um, in total. So, uh, the short answer, I'm not okay, no, give a, a, a comprehensive one. A short answer is yes, because you aggregate all this, uh, all your income up to determine how much you need to contribute. Mm. Okay. okay, thanks, Desmond, for that uh, answer. Mm. Uh, back to David. Aside from topping up and saving uh, with CPF, uh, do you save and invest your money through other methods? Yeah, I think previously I shared, uh, other than CP CPF, I think I, investing is also very important. And then at the same time, I think, you know, I mean, recently the hot topic is like talking about Singapore savings bond and then fixed deposit, all this stuff. Uh, I think it's important to make that part of your portfolio mm -hmm. as the so-called low risk, low risk uh, bracket. And then CPF is like the foundation. And then at the top will be if you are into investing, because a lot of people not really very, I mean, from the clients that I coach, not everyone is uh, like to take out a lot of risk. So at the same time, if they are risk adverse, probably CPF and then the SSP and FD will be something sufficient mm. for people to, to kind of like uh, leverage on for their mm. retirement and then to grow their wealth. Mm. Okay, thanks for that answer. Mm. Okay. Okay, so actually this one may be can open for both uh, Desmond and David. So this person asks, uh, says that um, I'm a freelancer with variable NTI and top up my CPF regularly. Uh, but what has it that my loan can't be approved to buy a house because banks do not take my CPF top up into consideration? Mm. Is this true? Maybe start from Desmond. Okay, for this um, question, uh, you, I, th I think you may have to do check with the bank. What exactly uh, did they uh, look into uh, in, in terms of uh, taking the consideration? Uh, but uh, what we, we can say here is, I think if I'm a bank, normally we look into the uh, what is the income stream because I think as a bank, they would have to ensure that what's the risk profile when they lend the money you know, to any individual, what is the, uh, uh, the likelihood of default by any individual. So I think uh, what's important 
maybe if you have to really try to talk to your to your bank is uh, you know, discuss with them your risk profile for them to take into account when they when, um, make loans. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know, if you have um, a top up your CPF to your three accounts, you have a mass of monies in your ordinary accounts, the money in ordinary accounts can be used for your housing purchase as well. So mm -hmm. it's not as if, uh, I mean, that the top ups, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. help you in achieving your goal in uh, owning your own house. Mm -hmm. How about David? Do you have like mm -hmm. any experience that with this? Okay, I mean, that one will depend on the, the bank requirements. Yeah, the bank requirements. I'm not sure why they don't take yeah. the top out yeah. And actually, uh, in addition to <laughs> bank loan, right, there's also the HDB loan that you can consider. So yeah, so if let's say bank loan, you can't uh, get a bank loan, you can also consider getting a HDB loan. But of course, there are differences. Uh, uh, mainly, I think, is the interest rate. So just to share a bit, uh, if you take a HDB loan, um, the interest rate is packed uh, 0.1% above the uh, CPF ordinary account. So currently, HDB loan, the interest rate is at 2.6%. Uh, whereas for banks, right, their interest uh, rates fluctuate according to the market conditions. So I think last, last year and past years, the interest rate has been pretty low. But now I think we all see news that interest rates are getting quite high. I think mm. uh, currently now some it's of the... higher loan, than 2.6%. Yeah, I think mm. I saw news that say that some of the interest rate may go up to 3 or even 4%. Mm. So yeah, so when you take up a bank loan, do um, weigh between these two options, either HDB or bank loan, and see which option is uh, more suitable for you. Okay. Uh, next question is for Desmond. Okay. I'm collecting my BTO flat in two years' time. Would I be able to use 100% of the balance in my CPF OA to pay for the flat at the point of key collection? Wow, this is uh, really testing my knowledge from, <laughs> <laughs> from uh, many years ago. Uh, I believe that uh, if you take, I mean, there are certain rules in place uh, uh, to check with your, I mean, confirm if you're an HDB officer. But uh, prior to, if you take an HDB loan, they might require you to use a certain amount of your CPF um, to pay off the, the upfront before granting you the loan as well. Uh. Um, so, based on my knowledge, um, I would say, if I'm not wrong, it's can, you, you should be able 100% of the OA to pay for your mm -hmm. HDB flat if you're taking on an HDB loan. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, some people we know may want to set aside some uh, savings itself, you know, for, conting mm -hmm. for contingency needs for maybe, you know, they are, uh, when they're unemployed mm -hmm. or they are in the midst of switching jobs, they want to have some reserves of mm -hmm. cash to pay off their loans rather than, you know, um, what we say, like show hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, like what Desmond shared, if you, let's say, uh, you're getting BTO under the HDB loan, you mm. can use 100%. Yeah. But do bear in mind that the CPF savings in your account will eventually be your retirement yeah. uh, savings. Okay, So the more you use for your HDB loan means the lesser retirement savings that you may have. Uh. Mm. So yeah, what he mentioned also, do set aside uh, uh, maybe about $20,000 in your OA mm. so that in case, that you no know, circumstances or uh, you're not able to uh, pay for your mortgage loan right at least you can still fall back on the twenty thousand yeah. dollars in your OA. okay uh okay so this is uh for david okay so this one is more about um his uh, minimalism so uh this person is asking does adopting a minimalist lifestyle means that i have to give up all the luxuries and how do you reward yourself and your family yeah so um Actually, minimalist lifestyle is not about, um, it's very different from frugality. Minimalism, I can have minimalism lifestyle, but I focus on, more, all, I mean like, I buy shoes, right? I mean, probably I buy, uh, I used to like oh, buy 10 shoes, you know, that kind of thing. But minimalist lifestyle means focusing on probably two or three that kind of fits all your needs. And then you, a bit more money spend mm -hmm. on better ones. Yeah, it doesn't really mean that you really scream and save just to live that kind of lifestyle. So mm. for me and my family, we don't really scream and say, but we have lesser things, but these are things that we value more. Yeah, because sometimes like due to marketing, all these things, right? Mm. And you tend to, oh, I want to buy this shoe, buy this shoe. It's like, I mean, yeah, sometimes it's very difficult to, to stop that temptation. Mm -hmm. But our minimalism is about talking about not listening to all this noise and then streamlining mm. or focus mm. on what is important. Yeah, so uh, I don't think we kind of like foresee a lot of luxuries. We still travel, mm -hmm. we still do like road trips. I mean, nowadays started to travel, mm -hmm. like go Malaysia on road trips. Mm -hmm. So we focus more on experience rather than um, like 
now nowadays like society is like our oh, kids must go um I don't know some certain country mm. must go Japan must go Korea must go Australia you know that kind of mm. but I I advocate in a way like we used to go there I mean not not saying that we won't go in future but now we are focusing more on the experience like uh having a road trip kind of like give you that experience that is more valuable in terms mm. of just um paying paying for something and then you get the the experience back you know that kind mm. of thing but you create value by uh, having the experience i think it's more important so mm. that will be our focus at least for the uh, when my kids were still young <laughs> Mm, yeah. I think yeah for the younger generation nowadays they have a lot of options mm, so yeah. I don't have kids myself but I do feel that sometimes even for us right we have too many options and mm. that is the problem so sometimes I yeah I for myself I sometimes also do end up spending on things that after that I'll be like mm, actually I don't need it yeah. like why <laughs> do I normal. buy it so I actually read somewhere that there's a tip mm. uh, that when you see something that you like actually pause for like maybe five seconds mm. think that uh, so ask yourself this question without this thing uh, will it affect you will it inconvenience you <laughs> yeah in any way so so that's one question that i try to ask myself mm. la, before i buy anything that i see i like okay okay yeah. so uh, okay let's move on to the next question okay uh, so for this is for Desmond. Okay, so he's asking for those with uh, NTI above six thousand dollars and declared their income with CPF, do they still need to declare th their NTI with IRAS? Mm. Typically, for those with uh, NTI above six thousand, uh, IRAS will be um, sending you uh, tax declaration. So you make declaration to um, IRAS. But if you have not received um, this uh, notice from IRAS. And if you make declaration from CPF, then you do not need to make further declaration from IRAS because we will pass your information, what you have declared to us, to IRAS, and they'll make they'll be going to records and uh, maybe from next, the day after the IRAS will start uh, sending you the declaration. Okay, thanks for taking that question. Okay, so this is for both uh, Desmond and David. I am fifty five right now, unemployed. Uh, fully paid for my flat and no savings in CPF account. Uh, I have around 150000 in, I would say, uh, assume the bank account savings. What would be a good retirement plan? Okay, so maybe start with David. What mm, do you uh, think advice would you give this person? 55 unemployed, fully paid flat. Uh, so probably the first question is, uh, do they have like, I don't know, CPF life in place already? CPF life, not yet. Not yet in place. Uh. So, yet. Mm. so so probably depending on again his uh unemployed probably um topping up the CPF might be one good option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean if he's not going to work into a full time job, it's like if he's going to hustle for for the rest and then I mean not much information here. Mm. I don't know if got family or not, if got kids or not. I mean uh <laughs> so uh CPF life is good if you have you can leverage on. I mean, I think at the age of 55, I employ fully paid. I wouldn't recommend you 150k to go into investment or whatever because I think the, there's not much mm. runway to go, not much mm. uh, time horizon. So, uh, so uh, basically, I probably need more information to, <laughs> to tell mm. how to have a good retirement plan. Mm. <laughs> okay, yeah. how about that? Smith? So, in this situation, I would say that um, I do agree where David coming, is coming from. Uh, I think what is a good retirement plan would depend on what is your needs in retirement as well. Mm -hmm. um, different people have dif um, different needs in retirement. Mm -hmm. Some people will say that, oh, I want maybe $1,000 a month, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and then right. from there, you know, for how long, and then how much you need to accumulate. Yeah, right. And then so you have to, to work out. And, and, and um, I also agree with the point is the, you know, CPF life is really the <laughs> again. I'm going to sell Koyo. You know? <laughs> uh, in terms of an asset that provides you income for life, in terms of the value for money, I think um, there is few. Lah. In fact, maybe no mm. such instrument currently in the financial market that, that is as attractive as CPF life. So, mm. if, if you are if in this situation, you may. Um, uh, want to consider uh, topping up your CPF and then um, purchase a CPF life plan. But um, 
in this sense, 55 is still relatively uh, yeah, right, healthy. Right, right. I think you, you, you still have to find a way to generate some yeah, income to work. to work or between mm. 55 to the point when you're 65 where you can start receiving payouts mm, um, from the CPF life. So that is something you need to, to consider. Mm. Uh, in truth, if you just work out um, even uh, maybe a 1,000, 1, 150K uh, over a lifetime, mm. it really doesn't generate a lot of uh, yeah. income. Mm. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So just now, uh, Desmond and David shared briefly about CPF life. Then uh, maybe I also share briefly about what exactly it is if you're not very sure how it works. So basically, CPF life uh, is a scheme for those who are age 65 and above. So at age 55, you will have your retirement account mm. set up already. And if let's say you have some savings in your retirement account, actually you mm. can uh, withdraw certain uh, uh, some money from that uh, mm. depending on uh, certain conditions. Mm. Then at age 65, right, that's when you can choose to go to CPF Life. Mm. So CPF Life is basically a scheme, a scheme that ensures a, a lifelong monthly payouts mm. no matter how long you live. So it's a scheme where um, you use your CPF savings to join and then um, you get monthly payouts from there. Even let's say your uh, monthly, uh, your savings has run out, right? You will still continue to get a monthly payout under CPF life. So like just now, uh, Desmond and David has uh, suggested, if let's say you, you know, you have about $150,000 in cash, right? If you let it sit in the bank account right now, how much interest rate will that gather? Mm. Okay, not much. So if you want, you can actually start um, uh, topping up mm. um, to a CPF account and let it grow. So that at least at age 65, uh, within these 10 years with the compounding interest, right? Uh, your uh, retirement account savings will grow. And so that when you join CPF Life, um, the monthly payout uh, will be calculated based on the retirement uh, savings that you have. Okay, so like what Desmond has shared, if let's say you need about, um, there's actually a calculator on our CPF website, uh, you can check out CPF Life Estimator. So if let's say you felt that you need about $1,000 uh, by the time you reach 65, right, you can actually use that calculator to check then how much of the retirement account savings you will need. Okay, so of course, the more um, monthly payouts you need, the more uh, retirement uh, savings, uh, sorry, the more monthly payout you need, then the more retirement mm. account savings that you need. Yeah. So I would say uh, from all three of us, you may want to consider yeah. topping up your CPF. Yeah. yeah. If, if I may add on, I, guess some, um, I thought where we pointed out the fully paid, paid flat is quite oh, an important yeah. asset. <laughs> so um, one option you might want to look at is to get in touch with HDB to learn more about the lease buyback scheme. Mm. This is a scheme whereby you know they will um, uh, uh, purchase from you the tail end of mm. your your lease, and also give you a a, a sum of uh, money as well, which you can actually also mm. put into CPF life. Mm. So this is uh, I, I think in layman terms, uh, what they call reverse mortgage, reverse mortgage in in, yeah, in a way. So mm. uh, that's a quite important asset. You know, of course, some other people would say that depend on individual needs again. Mm. They do um, uh, rent out one or two mm. of their rooms if they're eligible again. Mm. Uh, so to get, generate some some income yeah, as well. Right. So these are some options. Um, when I look at this, the, the question again, yeah, you know, this full, uh, fully paid flat is something that uh, yeah, they can, it, leverage, they, they can leverage on. Mm. So yeah, this uh, you can maybe uh, look up uh, some information on the HDB website as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, next question also for Desmond. After age fifty five, can we withdraw money from our OA for our daily expenses? Uh, that is like, you know, if we operate it like a bank savings or check account, is that a limit for withdrawal work? Well, this is, uh, my, you got to go very um, step by step <laughs> in how we determine whether your money can yes. um, with, 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 uh, draw um, for your OA. I think um, no matter what, uh, you are allowed to withdraw up to $5,000 from your OA for your um, expenses. I would say daily expenses, but basically it's what... You need maybe from 55 yeah. immediately all the way to uh, 65. Um, is it like a bank account or checking account? Um, of course, uh, from, for many of you, I mean, some of you rather, you may have already met your um, FRS inside your, your um, CPF account. Your RA is already at your FRS. So the, whatever monies you have in your OA, you can take it out any time that you want. Uh, I would say it's like a bank account or savings mm. account. Um, use it wisely and say that you have a plan. Mm. Um, I can't, I can't emphasize <laughs> uh, you know, enough about, what, about what, what, what do you mention, have a plan. And if you're going to uh, withdraw your money, so OA, um, what is it used for? Because it's really, um, 
I don't see any bank account out there um, you can take out at the 2.5% on mm-hmm. demand. Mm-hmm. Now it's a 2.5% is also probably more on the FD, yeah, or a certain correct. period, lock-in period yeah, as well. But um, work with a plan, um, use the money wisely, and yep, for those who, 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 who really need that money, yep, mm. you can take out the money. Yeah, because I think like maybe some people will be like, yeah, CPL always take my money, very hard to get my money. So actually it's not very true because yeah, like what Desmond mentioned, right? Mm. At age 35, you can withdraw the first $5,000 and if you have actually reached your full retirement sum, anything beyond the full retirement sum, you can also withdraw. Uh, and yeah, it's actually very convenient nowadays. Mm. We have pay now, pay now. so yeah. you can actually use pay now to get the money from your CPL account and no limit um, also you can withdraw anytime you want uh, depending on what frequency you want but like what uh, Desmond has mentioned if you have no immediate need right just keep it within the account don't withdraw it if you don't need it so and continue to let the savings grow yeah and then until age 65 when you join CPF life right then you can have you know, quite a substantial amount of retirement savings which will translate to a higher monthly payout okay on that note, right, mm. there's a lot of people who do the housing refund now. Ah, yeah. okay. So, uh, yes. I think this question is kind of like, if they do the housing refund, yes. then it will become like, after setting aside FRS, right, yes. then it will become like a bank saving yes. account. Yeah. In a way, yes, but it's up to the limit of the housing refund. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what David it. mentioned about the what we call the voluntary housing refund. So basically, voluntary housing refund means that even if, let's say, you are still servicing your mortgage, right, you haven't fully paid out your home purchase, uh, you can still continue, you can actually choose to refund in cash to your OA savings uh, for those amount that you have used for your housing purchase. Okay, so that is, yeah, voluntary housing uh, refund. So that it will help you to grow your OA savings uh, as you continue to pay for your mortgage loans. Okay. So, uh, okay, so we are down to our last question, okay? So, yeah, so if you have any, uh, we are not able to, if you are not able to answer your questions today, uh, our apologies. So, do say, uh, write in to us if you have any other further questions, okay? Uh, so, the last question, uh, please, for both uh, Desmond and David, okay? What is your best investment so far? Maybe start from Desmond? <laughs> <laughs> Best. The CPF. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I say, for example, you know, if, if um, it's, it's, for, it's, it starts from a lot of things like prudent purchase of housing, mm. um, not you um, buying a, a, I would say, some, not, not okay, something within your means, mm-hmm. a property with your means, you know, it helped me build up quite a substantial uh, uh, amount in my CPF. I would say that it really, really helps. Um, uh, but of course, I think the question I was asking what is, what is uh, uh, you know, financial investment so far. Um, I think it goes with time. You know, um, some people will say stock, some people will say equ- uh, equities. Um, I, I will say that um, I guess, you know, this uh, may not be a, a, a timeless question, but it depends on, on where it is. I mean, the only timeless answer I have is CPF. But um, <laughs> the, the most recent, I, I agree where, where David is coming from. I, I think um, there's a limit to it, but um, so far for, I would say that if you want to preserve some uh, sub, a good return as well as a fair amount of liquidity, the SSB, Singapore Savings Bond, is quite a good uh, investment. Uh, money inside gives, I think currently it's not a bad uh, return. Mm-hmm. Currently, in the last three or four countries, two and a half, two and, I think currently it's 2.6, three. Three, three, I think it gives you, and then that's locks in 10 years of returns, mm-hmm. which is a very end. And really, if you when you need your your savings, you can sort of uh, uh, redeem your SSB mm. and get it by the end of the the month. Mm. So that is a uh, quite a good uh, savings instrument that uh, you 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 put in. Uh, no worries. Yeah, uh, it is really something that is, I would say, um, relatively liquid. Mm. And in terms of the risk return profile, liquidity profile, I think that's quite a. Uh, something that um, I would encourage most people to, to look into. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So, best investment. Okay. For me, best investment, uh, probably more on the non tangible <laughs> side of it. Hmm. So, it's like because SEP, right, self employed people, right, we are always like, um, we are kind of like trying to strike out a business, strike out on our own, trying to do something that can kind of like give back to a society, that kind of thing. So, I think to have the courage to do that is important. 
I mean, especially for the younger generation, I think this is like a world that you can actually venture out and then go into uncharted waters and then go explore all this possibility. But at the same time, you need to kind of like study at the back of mind, you need to study about personal finance also, which I think is very important. So the investment, uh, even though you are doing your business, at the same time, you need to kind of like explore the I quadrant, the investor quadrant, mm -hmm. to make sure that you have something to fall back on. So, um, yeah, so, so for me, the best investment is uh, I, I have the courage to kind of like venture mm -hmm. into these two quadrants at the same mm -hmm. time, which I think is very important for as soon as you start employed. I mean, all these CPF, uh, equities, all these are just instruments that can help yeah. us along the way. But you need to have knowledge to do the asset allocation, your risk profiling, everything, so mm -hmm. that you can leverage on all these things that is already out there. But if you are not willing to kind of like learn more about it, then probably yeah, you might be in a very disadvantaged position mm -hmm. in case like my, my, my business didn't work out the way you want to be, mm -hmm. then you have nothing to fall back on. Yeah. So I think it's important. Yeah, and it's a very inve uh, important investment that you should make. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, time check. We are coming to the end of uh, today's webinar. Thanks very much for submitting a uh, very good questions. So uh, we hope that with our sharing today, um, y'all will be motivated and inspire you to start some uh, financial planning. Okay. So uh, we talked a lot. I think maybe you have a lot of uh, questions. Do check out our CPF website, like uh, Desmond mentioned, we revamped our website. So now uh, it's actually a much cleaner, much easier uh, website for you to navigate around. So for uh, we, there's a page uh, for the SCP, so do go to uh, cpf.gov.sg slash uh, uh, self-employed matters or uh, scan this QR code. Okay? And do check out uh, David's blog as well, okay, Minimalist in the City. I was reading the, some of the blog entries and it's actually quite interesting about how he shared, like, you know, even I think for his whole house renovation, how he adopted some minimalist uh, style to it, okay, so do check, check out his blog, okay. And also do check out our, of course, check out our social media channels. We are on various social media channels, okay, uh, even on uh, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all that. So, uh, yeah, do join, uh, follow us for bite-sized information on CPF. Okay? And lastly, okay, so coming up this year, we have the uh, CPF Ready for Life Digital Festival that will be happening on uh, 12 and 13 November. So through a, a series of uh, webinars and workshops, uh, um, all these webinars and workshops uh, will touch on various uh, topics, uh, interests and hobbies to inspire you hopefully to uh, find a uh, purpose in life and how um, then uh, can CPF comes in to help you achieve that purpose in life. Okay, so do register uh, for this event for 12 and 13 November. Okay, so and lastly, very importantly, before I end off, um, do give us your feedback. Um, for some of you, if let's say you have been to our previous SCP webinar, you probably realize that this today's session is something different. So let us know um, how is it, um, how can we improve, or any other topics that you would like us to share for our future webinars. Okay, so um, thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, have a good night, and we'll see you again. Goodbye.